Next up, we're going to go back now. This is now Meteorology 101, or maybe 01, 01. Ken McKinley is the principal with Locust Weather up, up in Rockport, Maine. Uh, pretty well known in the marine community. Serves as an instructor, commercial down here at, uh, at the Star Center, um, and as a router for clients. Ken. Thanks, Frank. Need a pointer? Um, I got one, actually. Okay. Uh, terrific introduction to the, uh, to the topic, and uh, hopefully uh, an introduction to what we're going to have for the day today. And my job, as uh, assigned by Frank, is to talk about the fundamentals and to talk about weather systems and, and on which I hope that uh, the presenters who come after me will be able to build, and so that I'll take care of some of the, the mundane housekeeping, so to speak and allow the others to concentrate on a little more detail that uh, is something that you came here for. So basically what I'm going to do is start with some definitions and concepts, and I have a lot of material to get through, so a little bit of an apology in advance that I'm going to be running through a lot of slides fairly quickly. Uh, we are videoing the presentation, so that will be available uh, at some point in the future, so you'll be able to refer back to that. Uh, talk about the general circulation of the atmosphere a little bit, and then talks about some weather systems. Not all the weather systems that you're going to encounter, but some of the ones that uh, give us a basis for looking at uh, how we look at the charts and things of that nature. Fronts, the mid-latitude low, tropical cyclones, synoptic systems, which I'll talk about here briefly. And after me, uh, Lee Chesno, about 500 millibar conditions, um, and then back to Frank for ocean currents and waves, and then this afternoon some talks of forecasts and forecasting, Joe Sinkowitz, Ken Campbell, and some communications with Ralph and, uh, and Jim, uh, and then a roundtable talk about how we put it all together. So that's where we're going. Um, put your tray tables up, fasten your seat belt, and hang on. Start with the definition of atmospheric pressure. Seems as good a place to start as anything. Uh, as Frank mentioned, the atmosphere is three-dimensional. And if you have a barometer on board, uh, and you use it and determine what the atmospheric pressure is, uh, and as you can see up here, it can be defined as the force exerted by a column of air. The atmosphere is three-dimensional and it weighs something. And so you can popularly think of the atmosphere extending from here all the way up to space, and that weight of that column of air exerts a force, which we call atmospheric pressure. We typically measure it in uh, units of force per unit area. You've seen on barometers, inches or millimeters of mercury, uh, millibars and hectopascals. Millibars and hectopascals are the same thing. Uh, it's just that on some charts, especially overseas, you may see the abbreviation HPA instead of MB, but they're the same exact number. Okay? The average atmospheric pressure over the whole world, 29.92 inches of mercury, 760 millimeters of mercury, 1,013.25 millibars or hectopascals. Okay? And so we can measure atmospheric pressure at a bunch of different locations, and that tells us something about the differences in the flow. It helps us define the atmosphere. Frank talked about the initial conditions that we want to start with, and this is one of the ways that we get that. When we do that, we can present the data on a map. We can connect the dots, if you will, draw lines of equal pressure, which are called isobars, and they can give us a visualization of the pressure field and allow us to find different uh, features in the pressure field, which helps us to determine where the weather systems are. Okay? So we're going to move ahead now and talk about wind. As your sailors, this is what you are really concerned about. Where's the wind? We define it as a horizontal movement of air. Okay? And there are some forces that affect the horizontal movement of air, and we'll talk briefly about how you put those forces together to determine what the wind is going to be. First is the pressure gradient force. We talked about the definition of pressure. If the pressure, if the weight of the column of air here is higher than it is over here, then there's going to be a force exerted from the higher pressure toward the lower pressure. That's called a pressure gradient force. A gradient is change with distance. Okay? On a weather chart, that's going to be oriented perpendicular to the isobars that are drawn on the chart. And the magnitude of it is going to be proportional to the pressure gradient, and the pressure gradient on the chart is shown by the distance or the spacing between the isobars. If the pressure is changing fairly quickly over a short distance, you're going to have a lot of isobars drawn on the chart, and that indicates a stronger pressure gradient, which contributes toward the horizontal movement of the air or the wind. Here's a weather chart with isobars. They're labeled, in this case, uh, two digits, uh, 1,000 millibars, 1,008 millibars, et cetera. And we can see that in this area here, we have a lot of isobars over a relatively short distance. That indicates a strong pressure gradient. Down here, the isobars are fairly far apart, but we still have a pressure gradient. It's just not a okay. 
pressure gradient force. Coriolis effect, uh, Frank mentioned Isaac Newton. He came up with basic equations that talk about uh, how things move. Uh, and his equations work very well, but they work in what's called an inertial frame of reference or a non-moving frame of reference. Our frame of reference is moving because the Earth rotates. And so we have to add a correction factor for the grid which we observe things on, which is latitude and longitude, uh, that allows us to make the equations work in that grid. And that's called the Coriolis effect. And most of you have probably heard of this. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, it acts to the right of motion, tends to deflect the motion to the right, avoid the pressure gradient. The initial direction of the motion doesn't matter. In other words, whether it's north, east, south, or west, it's still going to be deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. The magnitude of the Coriolis effect proportional to the speed of motion. If the speed of motion is faster, the deflection will be more. And the effect does depend on latitude, and that's because what we're interested in is the amount of rotation about a local vertical axis. And at the equator, the local vertical axis isn't rotating at all. It just goes around and around. Where at the pole, if you stick a pencil in the ground, there's a lot of rotation about it. Friction. Frank talked a little bit about that and, and the turbulent flows. Basically, it, it is what it seems to be physical contact with the surface. It's going to slow things down. Okay? And it'll act in the opposition of motion. Modifying friction is one of the more difficult things that we have to do as meteorologists in putting models together because the friction is so different, not only spatially but temporally. So let's put it all together. I have a little chart here drawn with some isobars. Very simple situation here. And if we put a, a, a dot on the chart to represent a spot where we have things, and if we decide, okay, let's stop motion, stop time, and, and play God here and say, okay, we're going to stop time. If this thing is not moving, then the only of those three forces that's acting on it is the pressure gradient force, which is acting from higher pressure toward lower pressure, like this. If now we take the brakes off and things start to move, well, that little dot there is going to begin to move in the direction that the pressure gradient force takes it. As soon as it begins to move, now we have some deflection to the right in the northern hemisphere. It moves a little bit faster as it comes more and more under the influence of the pressure gradient force. And basically, as we have taken the brakes off and let this thing move, we'll see eventually an uh, equilibrium be reached when we get to the point where, as it moves faster and faster, it's deflected more and more, and we come to, and neglecting friction for the moment, we come to the situation where uh, the result motion is exactly parallel to the isobars. This is called the geostrophic wind. Okay. Depends on uh, geostrophic approximation, the balance between pressure gradient force and the Coriolis so acting uh, with a result motion parallel to the isobar. Okay. There's all the characteristics of the geostrophic wind. And so we can look at a weather chart and we can figure out roughly what we're going to be looking at for wind. Now, if we enter uh, friction into the fracture, what's that going to do? That's going to act in opposition to the motion. It's going to slow the motion down. So which of the two forces are going to be affected? Well, the pressure gradient force is defined by the isobar, so that's not affected. But the Coriolis effect with slower motion will not be as much. Okay? And so we'll end up with a situation where we have the Coriolis deflection not being quite as far, and so we'll end up seeing a situation where the, uh, the flow is going to be uh, across the isobars a little bit toward lower pressure we end up with a resultant flow that looks a little bit more like this. And that angle across the isobars, we like to say about 30 degrees, but it varies quite a bit, and that's because of the nature of friction, which is going to be varying quite a bit depending on the nature of the surface. Sometimes that angle will be quite a bit more, sometimes it's a little bit less. So we end up with a situation that looks like this as our uh, surface wind. If we know what the isobars look like, we can determine with some reasonable accuracy. Again, as Frank mentioned, it's, there's a little bit of turbulence involved here, so it's not absolute. But we can make a reasonably good estimate, given an isobaric flow, what the wind direction and, and speed is going to be. Bias balance law, Dutch meteorologist, back history lesson. In the northern hemisphere, if you stand with your back to the wind, low pressure found to your left, high pressure found to your right. We get this guy's name and put a law on it. Sounds like. Why would we put a law on that? Well, you have to remember back in the 1600s when he came up with this, there were, not all ships even had barometers. It was quite a discovery at the time, but we use it today still. Okay? Bottom line, if you have a weather chart with isobars, you should be able to make a good estimation of wind speed and direction. And now we can talk about weather systems and what's the flow around weather systems. And all we have to do do the same exercise that we just did, say, where's the pressure gradient force? How's the Coriolis deflection? 
uh, impact that. If we look at this position right here, the, the pressure gradient force is from high toward low pressure or toward the center of the low, deflection to the right of motion, and we end up with a resultant wind direction like that, neglecting friction for the moment. We can do it in a lot of other different places around this area of lower pressure. Again, the pressure measured at various different points, and we connect the isobars, connect the dots, so to speak, and we'll find out that in the northern hemisphere, the circulation around lows is counterclockwise. And you knew that. Now you know why. Okay. If we put friction into the mix, changes things a little bit, and we have, instead of uh, exactly circular flow, we have a flow that's going to be counterclockwise and inward toward the center of low pressure. Okay. And much the same thing with areas of high pressure, and we'll find that we have, as we do that same analysis, pick a point, find out where the pressure gradient force is, in this case the pressure gradient force away from the center of the high, deflection to the right of motion in the northern hemisphere, and we find, and putting friction into the mix, we find that our circulation around high pressure centers in the northern hemisphere is clockwise and outward. In the southern hemisphere, the rotation is reversed, but the inward outward stays the same. So, for example, for a high in the southern hemisphere, it would be counterclockwise, but still out. Okay? As I said, running through a material that normally would take a couple of hours to talk about all the, friction, all the uh, fundamentals of, but just trying to lay down some fundamentals for you this morning. Okay. Some more definitions and concepts. Frank talked about the latent caloric or latent heat. So we need to know how much moisture we have in the atmosphere at any given time. It ends up being a very important variable for a lot of reasons. And so some definitions here. Relative humidity, you've all heard that term on television or radio weather forecast. It's a ratio of the actual water vapor content, in other words, water in the gaseous phase in the atmosphere, how much is there, divided by what we call the saturation water vapor content, which is the maximum amount of water vapor on temperature. Okay? And the ratio can have a value between 0 and 1. And you most often hear it expressed as a percentage, so take that value, that ratio, multiply it by 100. Okay. The dew point, temperature to which air must be cooled to reach saturation. So in any given situation, you may have uh, uh, an amount of water vapor in the air that's less than the maximum amount. That maximum amount depends on temperature. If you lower the temperature, the maximum amount will be lowered as well. And sooner or later, that ratio is going to end up being 1. Uh, and that's when you have what we call saturation and the definition of saturation there. The atmosphere contains water vapor as possible at its temperature. Okay. So what does it mean when the air is saturated? Well, the temperature will be the same as the dew point. Can't cool it anymore to reach the dew point. Okay. And the relative humidity, that ratio, is 1 or is expressed as 100%. And the bottom line, again, at saturation, the air contains as much water vapor as possible at its current temperature. File that away. During changes of state, Solid to liquid, liquid to gas. Solid to gas, there are a lot of different changes of state. Heat is exchanged between the water, the water molecules, and the environment. Okay? And in particular, in the atmosphere, we're particularly concerned about the situation where the condensation process is occurring. In other words, the gas to liquid phase change. Okay? And in that case, heat is released. The water level, the water molecules are going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, and they give up energy during that phase change, and that energy is manifested as heat. Okay, so it gives up heat. And that ends up being really important in the dynamic atmosphere and in terms of weather systems. And we'll see why here in, in, a sh in very short order in the next couple of slides. Again, running through this stuff very, very quickly, fundamentals. We're interested in vertical motion in the atmosphere. Three-dimensional in both in the horizontal motion, the north, south, east, west, because that's what you're going to make your boat move with. But as far as weather systems are concerned, we're interested in how things move up and down in the atmosphere as well. Now, that motion is an order of magnitude less than the horizontal motion in general. Uh, but it ends up important in the development of atmospheric systems and actually in the weather that we see and ends up having impacts on uh, pressure changes and the like. Okay? When air moves vertically in the atmosphere, it experiences a change in pressure. Think back to our definition of pressure. Pressure is the weight of the column above a point. So if you go up, if I climb up to the back of this auditorium, I'm going up, and I've left behind a little bit of air here, so the, now my barometer is going to read a little bit lower. Okay? So if you have rising air, it will, it will undergo a change in pressure to a lower pressure value. And we can use the basic gas laws to 
define that change in temperature. If vertically moving air and higher pressure, it'll be compressed. It'll warm up. Okay? And on the other hand, if it encounters lower pressure, it'll expand and it'll become colder. Some high school physics there. Okay? So rising air is going to cool off. Okay? So air rising in the atmosphere will cool. Sinking air will warm. Okay? Why is that of interest? Whoops. I've been on Frank's remote. <laughs> I pushed the wrong button there. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, we all set? Okay, nope. turn, the, turn things back on here, here we go. So, back to talking about vertical motion in the atmosphere. As rising air cools, it will often cool to its dew point. Now we're putting some of the pieces together here. And if further upward motion, thus more cooling occurs, then you have to condense out some of the water vapor. Okay, and that's when the latent heat of condensation becomes a, a factor. We also see the development of clouds and eventually precipitation in this case. Uh, but the latent heat of condensation will add some energy to that rising air. Okay. Two ways of vertical motion be initiated. Forced vertical motion, in other words, air moving along and it hits something and it's got nowhere to go but up mountain range or change in terrain or something of that nature. And also in the atmosphere, when we talk about fronts, which we'll talk about shortly, um, there's a, some forced vertical motion. There's also uh, atmospheric instability, which depends on the vertical temperature profile of the atmosphere. Okay, not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but the situation is unstable. Whenever the lifted air ends up warmer than the air that's already at the level that it was lifted to, then it, therefore it becomes more buoyant and it keeps going, and we end up with vertical cloud development, the possibility of thunderstorms, showers, and the like. Okay, when the atmosphere is unstable unforced vertical motions are more likely to occur. So when is it going to be unstable? When the existing temperature profile, which is measured by balloons sent up through the atmosphere, features temperatures dropping more quickly with height. Okay, so if it gets a lot colder aloft, a lot faster. And now we take a batch of air at one level of the atmosphere, we lift it, we know it's going to cool, but if it doesn't cool as much as the air that's already at the level that it's been lifted to, then we have an unstable situation. And the air is warmer than its surroundings and more buoyant. It's going to keep going. Okay? And that'll happen when low levels are relatively warm, like on a nice sunny afternoon. If anybody's a, a model airplane or a model kite enthusiast, you look for those nice warm sunny afternoons when the uh, ground is heated quite a bit and therefore tends to stretch out that temperature structure. Or if you have upper levels that are relatively cold, something at upper levels coming in, and by upper levels, talk about 500 millibar, you'll hear more about that shortly from Lee, uh, and that will lead to instability as well. And when the relative humidity of low and middle levels is high, because that allows this latent heat of condensation to come into play. And that means that as the air is lifted and the water is condensed out, it releases heat. And so the lifting air now cools more slowly. Okay? And the presence or absence of moisture in the atmosphere has a big role to play in the development of weather systems. Okay. So instability, we'll see the development of cumulus clouds on warm sunny days because the lower levels of the atmosphere are warmed up, leading to that instability. The vertical motion ensues, and if the air is lifted to the point where it can be saturated, then you'll see the development of cumulus clouds. And if it's very unstable and there's a lot of moisture, the clouds will be deeper vertically, and you'll see cumulonimbus clouds, showers, thunderstorms, uh, in extreme cases, more violent weather, especially if you can combine instability with some forced lifting. Okay, this is a real quick and dirty look at this topic, but again, just doing some building blocks for you. More definitions and concepts. Uh, just the definition of divergence and convergence, which is fairly simple. Air coming together we call convergent flow. Air moving apart we call divergent flow. Very obvious in a diagram like this. But in the atmosphere, we're more often looking at a situation like this where there's some portion of the flow that's divergent or convergent. 
Okay? And this becomes important when we start looking again in three dimensions, because we have a situation where if we have divergence at upper levels and convergence at lower levels, air coming together at the lower levels, no place for it to go but up. So you have some rising motion and then divergence aloft and you see that, that couplet completed, so to speak. And what happens to the surface pressure here? Well, if we make an assumption that the upper level winds are stronger than the surface winds, which is an assumption that works some significant portion of the time, and you go back to our definition of pressure, what's happening here? Well, we're shoveling stuff in at the bottom of the column and so the column's gonna weigh more because of that, but we're pulling more stuff out at the top and so the net result is gonna be a lower surface pressure. And so we're interested in knowing where the upper level divergence is in particular because that's gonna help determine what the surface pressure might be at a future time. The opposite situation, upper level convergence, surface divergence generally gonna to lead to downward motion. We're shoveling stuff in at the top of the column, not removing as much from the bottom. The weight of the column is gonna increase and we're gonna see higher surface pressure, okay? So we put all this together and take a look at what we call the global circulation or the three cell model. Uh, so called because we typically have three cells around the globe. And again, this is a very quick presentation of this. Uh, we've determined through a lot of observation and, and uh, some work done over many years that the atmospheric circulation tends to have belts of pressure. Low pressure along the equator, high pressure at the subtropical latitudes 30 north and 30 south, and subpolar low pressure along 60 north, 60 south roughly. Again, this is a model, so it's a theory, but it works pretty well, and polar high pressure. And if we take this pressure pattern and apply our forces for wind, in other words, pressure gradient force and Coriolis force, we can come up with these belts of pressure giving rise to zones of wind. There's our northeast trade winds. High to low pressure, deflected to the right, we see the northeast trade winds in these latitudes. The prevailing westerlies in the mid-latitudes and the polar easterlies uh, in the higher latitudes. And the same thing in the southern hemisphere, remembering that in the southern hemisphere, the Coriolis deflection is not to the left or to the right, but it is to the left and we end up with a similar uh, wind pattern in the southern hemisphere. These are our trade winds, okay? This is a model, a model to try to uh, assess the general large-scale circulation of the atmosphere, okay? We can take that model data and then can get another look at it here in a, in a better diagram than I can draw, looking at the three-dimensionality of it. And here you see the surface convergence and upper-level divergence with, uh, coinciding with low pressure. Here, surface divergence, upper level convergence, faster air moving in here and seeing high pressure and with low pressure here, high pressure at the poles as well, okay? We can take this theoretical look at the atmosphere and then compare it to what we really see in the atmosphere. And here's a weather chart, which is uh, mean pressure and wind circulation for the month of January. This is not a daily weather map. This is a long-term average over the whole month of January for many number of years. And we can see the features show up here. Here's our subtropical highs showing up here. Here's our intertropical convergence zone, our belt of low pressure showing up here. And subtropical highs in the southern hemisphere. And down here, we'd expect to see subpolar lows. We don't see them on this chart, why? Well, because this is a long-term average. We know in the southern hemisphere that there are lots of really strong storms that move along through these latitudes but they're not any more likely to occur at this, any given longitude because they just scream around here. So in the long-term average, they get filtered out. In the Northern Hemisphere, because we have more land, we do have areas where we're more likely to see areas of low pressure, okay? And again, in the month of July, a similar type thing. So we, this, I show these charts only to see that that theory generally works with some variation, obviously, because the theory made some assumptions about the fact that the Earth was uniform in surface and it isn't, we have land and oceans. We also have uh, the fact that the Earth is tilted with respect to the orbital plane, and so that factors into it as well. So I just wanted to bring that up uh, to show basically that the theory is reasonable. And we're gonna talk about weather systems in the subtropics, or in the tropical latitudes, and in the mid-latitudes, okay? Because that's where most of you are sailing, one place or the other. Quick look at what we call scales of weather systems. Planetary or global scale, we just looked at. Um, these are features that are large, tend to, tend to last for uh, many weeks or even a month or two, perhaps a whole season at times. Synoptic scale features, these are sometimes called weather map scale features. These are the highs and the lows and the fronts that you look at on the weather map from day to day. Time scales of uh, days and, and uh, 
hundreds of kilometers as far as the size are concerned. Mesoscale and microscale are the smaller scale features, which are more difficult to predict, but they still will affect you one way or the other, whether it's a squall line coming through or an area where there's light wind where the weather maps tell you you should have a lot of wind. Okay. Moving on now to weather systems. We laid down some of the fundamentals here. We're going to talk about fronts first. Uh, definition of a front, a boundary between dissimilar air masses. Okay. It's a boundary. Quite often you'll hear a television uh, meteorologist say something to the effect of a front is moving in. That's unfortunate terminology. A front passes your location because it's the boundary between two air masses. You could say there's a new air mass moving in, but the front is the boundary between the two air masses of different densities. Typically, colder air is denser than warmer air, okay? In most cases, fronts are moving, and the air masses involving both ahead of and behind the front are moving as well. And in many cases, the name of the front will give an indication of the air mass that's moving into a particular region or the leading edge of the new air mass. In the case of a cold front, Oh, cold air replacing warmer air at the surface, so a cold air mass moving in. And looking at the vertical structure, we see the cold air is denser. As it advances, it'll wedge underneath the warm, less dense air ahead of the front. And there's where your vertical motion comes in because that wedging is going to be forced vertical motion. It's going to, the denser air is going to force the less dense air to rise. And then we're going to get into that situation with latent heat release, development of clouds, etc. Okay. And if the moisture content of the warm air ahead of the front is high, and if the instability is uh, significant, then we frequently see showers and thunder showers associated with a cold front. If you have a dramatic difference between the two air masses involved, then you can see more violent weather. Okay, so looking at a very simple cross section here, the blue air is the cold air. Here's the front right here, it's the boundary. And it's moving in this direction from left to right across your screen. Slope of the front. About this number, the scale is vertically is uh, exaggerated here, so you can see what's going on. But the front is moving along, forcing this warmer air to rise. If the warmer air rises, it's eventually going to cool to its dew point, become saturated. You'll see the development of clouds, showers, and thunder showers. And I have this rudimentary animation here, which actually works pretty well in seeing the front advancing. Notice the scale here, by the way, 100 kilometers here, it only sit five kilometers here. Rising air, reaching its saturation point, developing showers and thunder showers. Structure of a cold front. Okay. Warm front, a little different. Warm air replacing cold air at the surface. This is a much more gradually sloped front. Uh, clouds will develop as that warm air rises over the cold air. And typically, you'll see a large area of steady precipitation. Cloud sequence, one of the most reliable weather indicators that you can see out there uh, without the use of instruments. See, well ahead of the front, you'll see high, thin cirrus clouds, mares tails, mackerel sky, that sort of thing. And if the front is approaching your position, then you'll see those clouds lower and thicken with time, and eventually steady precipitation will develop. If the clouds are not lowering and thickening, then the front may not be approaching your position. That may mean that it's not moving much, or it may mean that you're moving uh, in the same sp at the same speed as the front. Okay. So again, in this case, Warm air mass advancing in this direction, riding up over the colder air mass, and you're seeing the development of clouds and a steady area of precipitation. Not as steep as a cold front. Again, another animation. Uh, this would be better if the, if the front was actually moving. In this case, it's not, but in, in, uh, in most cases, these fronts are moving. But the air is riding up over the colder air, and you can see the cloud developing here in a very different way than with a cold front. So if you're out here in this position over near B, you may be starting to see high, thin, cirrus clouds. And then as you approach the front or the front approaches you, you're going to get into lowering and thickening cloud levels and eventually some steady precipitation. Occluded fronts, a cold front overtaking a warm front will result in an occluded front. Three air masses involved this time. The two cold air masses, one ahead of the warm front, the other behind the cold front, and in between the two, the warm air mass. Okay. And what happens with these? Oops. Ooh. <laughs> okay, done. <laughs> I blame Frank. He made, me, he made me use his clicker here. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Let me get back to where we are here. Well, it's, it's something's not liking this thing here. I don't know what's going on. 
Okay. Sorry about this. Here we are. Okay, here we go. Diagram of the occluded front. Here we've got a cold front. Again, the boundary between the cold air and the warm air. Here we've got a warm front. Cold front tending to move a little bit faster than the warm front. It's going to catch up to the warm front. And basically what's going to happen when that occurs is that the warm air mass is going to be bodily lifted right off the surface. Instead of just riding up over the warm front or being forced to rise ahead of the cold front, it'll be bodily lifted. And that initial lifting is going to lead to uh, more vertical motion and, and likely some steadier and heavier precipitation and perhaps some thunderstorm activity as well due to the cold frontal activity. Uh, with time, as the, as the air mass gets lifted off the uh, surface, a little bit more, we will have realized most of the moisture and the precipitation become lighter and more intermittent. Two types of occlusions, although uh, more recent research has indicated that uh, uh, the cold occlusions are not very common. But in both cases, the warm air mass lifted off the surface and with the frontal passage, you don't see as much of a temperature change, whether it's up or down, because the warm air is not present at the surface. Stationary front. Name tells it all, it's not moving. But you still have some uh, motion up over the front, the warmer air coming over the colder air, and some precipitation possible, um, usually light, perhaps intermittent at times, although if it stays in one place for a long time, the amount of precipitation can become more significant. And these are areas where mid-latitude lows often begin to develop. And that's what we're gonna move on to next, the mid-latitude lows, because these are the animals that will cause you some difficulty from time to time if you're sailing any distance over the ocean. tend to develop along stationary fronts, a boundary between a cold polar air mass to the north and a warm tropical air mass to the south in the northern hemisphere. So we'll take a look at a very fundamental uh, situation where we see a low pressure center developing. Here we have a stationary front. Area of high pressure here, we're looking at a, at a plan view here, north, south, east, and west, okay? High pressure area down here, haven't labeled these isobars, but this is a higher isobar, lower, lower. This front lies in what we call a trough of low pressure, so the pressure lowest along the front, but not lower at this particular time than any other place along the front. Northern hemisphere, bias balance law. We can figure out the uh, wind direction here. Pressure gradient from high to low pressure deflecting to the right, so the wind direction in this colder air is gonna be from the northeast in a northern hemisphere situation. Down here, the wind direction is going to be from the southwest. So wind shift across this stationary front of about 180 degrees. Okay. And then some feature with time may come along, and that's Lee's job next to talk about what that feature is, to cause the pressure along the stationary front to become a little bit lower than it is someplace else along the front. And so we get a little bit of a deviation here, a little bit of lower pressure. And that distorts the isobars instead of having them be straight across. Now we start to see a little bit of rotary motion, start to see a little bit of that counterclockwise circulation in the northern hemisphere around the low. A little bit of light precipitation develops. The cold air is now moving, so this frontal boundary now becomes the leading edge of colder air here and acts as a cold front over here. The, uh, this frontal boundary now moving in this direction, so it becomes a warm front. And if the processes are right, if the features are right, then the system may continue to develop with time and look a little bit more like this which is sort of your textbook classic mid-latitude low with a cold front, several isobars surrounding the low, a cold front extending off to its south and southwest, a warm front extending off to its east. Now, those directions can vary from time to time and place to place. As I say, this is sort of a textbook type situation, but if you learn nothing else in meteorology, we learn that the words always and never typically aren't in the vocabulary very much. In this case, we have a warm sector. Here's the warm air. In this, the warm air has punched up into the colder air here, the colder air behind. Steady precipitation ahead of the warm front. Showery, showers and thunder showers along the cold front. Wind direction, as the isobars would tell you, circulating around this system. And then perhaps with some time, we get the development of the occluded front, extending out from the low, uh, with the warm sector becoming detached from the low center. Uh, steady and perhaps heavy precipitation near this point here, which we call the triple point, where the three fronts meet and the precipitation becoming a little lighter and more intermittent back in this part of the low. Still have the warm sector here with the showery precipitation along the cold front and the steady precipitation ahead of the warm front. So I've labeled these day one, two, three, four, but in some cases this progression of events can happen much more quickly and the change in pressure can be much more rapid as well. Okay. Another slide here, very simple, without the isobars, just showing you 
where the air masses are. And I put it in here, try to visualize this in three dimensions, remembering the vertical structure of the cold front and the warm front that we just looked at. So here's this colder, dry air wedging underneath the warm air here, forcing it to rise and leading to that band of showers and thunder showers here. And here's this warm, moist air coming right up out of the screen here, rising. Again, as it rises, it cools, condenses. We get the development of precipitation and an area of steadier precipitation here. The mid-latitude low is sometimes called an extratropical low, or meaning not in the tropics. So here's a bunch of checks here. The warm sector we talked about between the two fronts Usually when that warm front and cold front are at right angles that we have the system reaching, nearing its strongest stage and the precipitation patterns are well established according to the frontal structure that we looked at. The cold front rotates around the southern end of the low, it'll catch up to the warm front. The occlusion process will begin and weakening often begins after the occlusion process is underway but not necessarily immediately and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, shortly. We talked about the triple point. Uh, sometimes at that triple point, we can get a secondary low developing or a new low center. And so that's a point that we want to watch out for uh, in certain situations. Sometimes that secondary low becomes even stronger than the original low was. And secondary lows frequently form off the Carolina coast, call them Hatteras lows. And what's the reason they might show up out there? Nice, nice injection of warm, moist air from the Gulf Stream, which adds instability, adds moisture, and back to that latent heat release that occurs as the upward motion is going. So processes are going on there. If no secondary low develops, then often you'll see gradual weakening as that warm air mass is lifted off the surface, leaving little contrast in air mass with time, and the low can dissipate or can, can continue sometimes as a, as a sort of non-dynamic low uh, without producing much precipitation, but still producing wind. Fronts lie in a trough of low pressure. You notice as we've drawn these uh, isobars around these lows that they're not perfectly circular, that you're seeing an extension of the isobars away from the center of the low, uh, and that's because the fronts themselves lie in a trough of low pressure. What does a trough of low pressure mean? It means that the pressure is lower along the trough than it is on either side. And we can see that in this chart here. If we look at these, if we cross this front in a perpendicular fashion. Here our pressure is 1,012, now it's down to 1,008, about 1,006 here at lowest point at the front, and then comes up again on the other side. So the distortion of the isobaric pattern shows up in these fronts. And what does that mean with respect to a front passing as far as the wind is concerned? It means particularly with cold fronts, you're likely to see a fairly abrupt shift in the wind as the front passes because of the kinking of the isobars away from the low. Precipitation around the low, as you would expect with the fronts. Here's the showers and thunder showers along and ahead of the cold front. In the warm sector, depending on how moist and unstable it is, you may have some isolated showers here and there, and it may just be partly cloudy. It may be okay. And then your area of steady precipitation showing up ahead of the warm front, heaviest near the center of the low, becoming a little bit more intermittent behind it. You often hear tell of the comma clouds uh, signature with a low, this doesn't show it terribly well, but you can see the, uh, the tail of the comma is the cold front, and the head of the comma is the solid cloud cover with the center of the low. Looking across here in cross section, we see the cold front and the warm front right here. Up in this area here, no fronts, but you see warm rear having ridden up here over uh, the warm front. You can see that lifted right off the surface here. Not an occluded front in this particular case, although you may see the development of one here in very short order. Wind patterns around the low, as you would expect with the isobars. In counterclockwise circulation around the lows, where the isobars are closer together, the winds are stronger. Abrupt wind shifts across the fronts. Smoother wind shifts in the, in the northern and western sector of the low. Again, northern hemisphere we're looking at here. Okay. So we have an idea now of the structure of these mid-latitude lows. Now, how are they going to move well, they're going to be moved depending on what's going on upstairs, upper level wind patterns, in other words, the 500 millibar chart. You've got a presenter with a great deal of experience in the 500 millibar chart, going to come up and tell you more about that soon. Sometimes the upper level patterns lead to a generally west to east motion, but other times more south to north or southwest to northeast. So knowing more about 500 millibar concepts will help you determine how these systems are going to move. So why do you care how they're going to move? Well. Maybe you're sailing from Chesapeake Bay to Bermuda, or maybe you're sailing from Newport to Bermuda. You got a low down here. 
if it goes up this way, what are you going to see? Well, if you're on this part of the route, you're going to see the passage of the warm front. You're going to get into the warm sector, see southerly winds. Maybe eventually the cold front comes through. If you're still back here, maybe you're going to see that wind backing and become more northerly with time. What if the low's moving in this direction? Well, you may see a different sequence of events. Or if it's moving off in this direction, then you're going to be looking at northeast winds along both of those routes for the entirety of the time that you're watching that low. So understanding the structure of these lows and then understanding how they're moving gives you a lot of information about the sailing trips that you're likely to take. What if you've got a low over here? And what if it moves off in this direction? Or what if it moves off in this direction? You know, all kinds of possibilities showing up here. A low here may move up in this direction, no impact to your route. But on the other hand, if it's coming uh, more easily or south easily, it may have an impact on your route. Maybe eventually the cold front trailing south and this low sweeps out across the route and causes some showers and thunder showers three or four days out. So again, you're going to want to watch these types of situations, all impacting your particular route and what's going on. So that's why we want to know about the structure of these particular lows. Forecasting lows, and you'll hear more, a lot more about that this afternoon from, from Joe Sinkowitz and Ken Campbell. Uh, depends on 500 millibar dynamics to a large extent. But an understanding of the basic structure of the lows, which we've just gone through, can help you figure out at least some short-term predictions. What's going to happen over the next few hours or half a day or something of that nature? Okay. Compare your present weather conditions with your understanding of the mid-latitude low. That'll give you an indication of where you're located with respect to the low. If you've got southwest winds, warm, humid conditions, you're probably in the warm sector of the low. On the other hand, if you're sitting there experiencing northeast winds and it's cloudy with steady rain, then you know that you're in a different position with respect to the low. How's your barometer changing? How's that going to affect what's going on? Okay. What's your wind speed and direction? What's your temperature? Is it relatively warm or relatively cold? What's the cloud cover like? Are you looking at that warm frontal cloud sequence going on in your position? And what type of precipitation is occurring? So look at your current weather conditions and determine where you might be with respect to the mid-latitude low. Once you know where you are, then you want to watch the trends. How are things changing? How's your barometer doing? Is your barometer rising or falling? Is it all moving toward you or is it moving away? Are you looking at that classic warm frontal cloud sequence? Uh, what's your wind direction doing? Is it backing or veering? Backing in the northern hemisphere means a wind shift in a counterclockwise direction from east to northeast to north, veering the other direction. Okay. Is your temperature rising or falling? All of these things, if you look at, if you understand the structure of the mid-latitude low and the weather associated with the fronts, will help you, at least in the short term, determine what might be coming up for your ship, for your vessel. Your mid-latitude low, triple point right here. And we're interested in that, why? Because we may see a secondary low showing up there. Uh, and we talked about the Gulf Stream out in that area, which you'll hear more about very shortly. So sometimes a secondary low will develop and you'll see it moving off in this direction with new fronts uh, like this and an isobaric pattern that becomes even stronger, still encompassing the original low fills in, so to speak, and you have a, an entirely new low. And this process can happen in as short a time frame as just a few hours. Um, and why is it important? Because it can have unexpected shifts in wind uh, and changes in conditions. And unexpected shifts in winds and changes in conditions are something that's going to get your attention. And if you can anticipate it, then you can uh, take some steps to deal with it. Mid-latitude low, January 4th, 2018. This is the blizzard, the northeastern blizzard. Here's, this, here's the low. There's the cold front. There's the warm front, your classic structure. We've got another frontal boundary in here, which is a coastal front, actually, boundary between some colder air, air in here. But here's the main structure of the low. Okay. 993, that says that the central pressure of the low at the time of this chart, which is an analysis chart, was 993 millibars. Developing hurricane force, that tells you something. Rapidly intensifying, that tells you something else. That's what we used to call a bomb, and the news media has, has glommed onto that and, and made a big deal about it, and they talk about it all the time, but it is a rigorously scientifically derived term. Okay, no, that's true. It was a professor at MIT, and it means the central pressure of a low drops at least one millibar per hour for 24 hours, so a 24 millibar temperature drop in 24 hours. 
Let's look at this right here. The arrow in this chart is indicating the future forecast position. It's below 24 hours after the valid time of the chart. And here's the central pressure forecast right here, 949 millibars. Going from 993 to 949, do the math, that's a little more than 24 millibars, quite a bit more as a matter of fact. Ken Campbell has a story to tell you this afternoon about that particular storm and, and involving a sailing vessel. 18 hours later, there it is. There's a, the occluded front developing in the triple point right here. Hurricane force low with a central pressure of 950 millibars. There's an awful lot of isobars in here. What does that mean? The wind is really strong. Okay. And so this can tell you that. I mean, if you are, you're going to have a 949 central pressure of a low, you're likely to have a lot of isobars there. Now, sometimes people ask me, well, what, what makes a low? Is, what's the pressure that makes a low? Well, it all depends. It's relative. But if you have a pressure that low, you're going to have a significant pressure gradient between the low and the surrounding area. There's a picture of it. There's the cold front. And you can see this solid cloud here north of the warm front. Okay. This is from the new, maybe Joe will talk about this this afternoon too, the new GOES-16 satellite up there, which is providing us with some really beautiful pictures. Um, and, and if you have a chance, look at it online uh, because it's, it's a big leap in technology. Okay, I want to talk briefly as we finish up the mid-latitude low here. Here's our, uh, our low sequence here, and you often see a low moving along. And I talked about the, uh, the cold front catching up to the occluded front. Well, in more recent years, we've done a little more research and, and talked about this process of the uh, occlusion process not necessarily being what we call a catch-up process, but more of a wrap-up process where the circulation of the low itself is sort of wrapping around in the counterclockwise fashion and wrapping this up. And sometimes that means that the warm front is actually not advancing. In some fact, sometimes it may actually be retrograding a little bit with the development of the occluded front. And you can kind of see it wrapping back like that. Uh, and that leads to, uh, as we call, wrap up instead of catch up. It was an article in the, one of the meteorology journals here a few years ago talking about that. And that leads us into talking about uh, a different cyclone model. What we've talked about right through this is called the Norwegian cyclone model. Frank had the Norwegians on the, on the screen a little bit earlier. And the remarkable part about that Norwegian cyclone model is, is it was devised by the Norwegians early in the 1900s. And they didn't have any satellite photographs. They had very limited observations of the upper atmosphere. They had very limited observations in general, but they were able to devise this theory of how the Lowe's structure worked. And it's held up quite well, even as the observational capability has increased. But we have found that some ocean storms have a slightly different structure having to do with this wrap-up situation. And often you get a, an occluded front wrapping behind the low. And we call this the Kaiser Shapiro model, named after some guys. Guys in meteorology always get their names on things, Coriolis and Bias Ballot, stuff like that. So anyway, in this case, you get this cold front, this occluded front wrapping behind them. And the cold air mass actually breaks off and leaves a little piece of warm air near the center of the low. And then you get this thing wrapping behind here, and there's a little bit of warm air in the middle here with this uh, warm occlusion and a lot of uh, isobars here as well. So this is a different model. And I bring this up. We don't have time to talk about the dynamics of it and things of that nature. But just to let you know that you might see something on the chart that looks a little bit different than the sort of textbook examples that I gave you. And here's a situation that happened just a couple of weeks ago where we had a low that looked like that out here. This is the 19th of January. And here's a low, and you can see this occluded front wrapped all the way around. And there's warm air in here, uh, storm force winds forecast here, uh, and the low moving off in this direction. This is not a rapidly developing system. And in fact, oftentimes when you have that occluded front developing, it means that the system may have peaked in its intensity or certainly isn't going to strengthen that much anymore. And uh, just another look at the same thing so you can see the detail. Here's the triple point still right here, but you've got this occluded front wrapped all the way around the system. And that's what it looked like on a, on a satellite photograph. You can sort of see the warm air wrapped back in here. Here's the cold front. That cold frontal structure is the same. Um, again, zooming in to get a little bit better of a look at that. That was an infrared picture, not as pretty as the visible pictures. Okay, So that's a real quick and dirty look at mid-latitude lows, which are going to be prevalent year-round. They're going to be stronger in the wintertime, generally, because they have a greater temperature contrast through latitudes during that time of the year. Um, but uh, knowing the structure of those mid-latitude lows will help you quite a bit in looking at forecasts and looking at charts and deciding what's going to happen for your particular vessel. One quick slide to, to preview Frank coming up here a little bit later this afternoon about the Gulf Stream. I, I threw this, this is just interesting, so I threw it up here. Here's a surface analysis chart from a couple of years ago. And look at this little red box out here. What's going on out there? Not too much. 
not too many isobars. It's sort of on the periphery of a high. The, the lows and the fronts are well off to the west. But we take a look at that box and then look at ASCAT imagery, satellite imagery of wind. And even though that box was showing us a fairly benign situation, we had the wind showing very clear structure of the Gulf Stream there. And I just put that up teasing Frank. I don't want you to go away or anything like that. You might miss something later on. OK. Tropical cyclones, tropical storms, tropical, uh, tropical depressions, tropical storms, hurricanes. Strongest systems on Earth. They have the most energy. And again, we're going to do a real quick and dirty look through at these things. Uh, very strong low pressure systems that originate in tropical latitudes. Some similarities between the mid-latitude lows we've just talked about, but some fundamental differences as well, especially in their formation and in their structure. Okay. We're going to talk about the most typical process of so-called pure tropical development. And they often start with a rather fragile disturbance in the atmosphere south in the northern hemisphere of the subtropical ridge or equator of the subtropical ridge of high pressure. So we'll take a quick look at that, again, in a quick and dirty situation. Here's a, a plan view here again, north, south, east, west. Subtropical ridge of high pressure sits up here. South of that subtropical ridge, our three-cell model tells us that we have trade winds generally from the east, northeast. Again, we're looking at a northern hemisphere situation. And uh, if you sail in these latitudes at all, you know that from time to time you'll see a passing shower. And often they'll be fairly brief and, and wash down the deck, get the salt off the boat, that sort of thing. And then the sun is out again within a half an hour or so. But sometimes you'll get uh, a line or a cluster of these thunderstorms to persist for some period of time. And if they do, then that upward motion that's going on with, uh, will lower the pressure with time and we'll end up seeing a distortion in the isobaric pattern here. And this is what we call a trough of low pressure, an inverted trough, if you will, uh, or a tropical wave. Uh, and this inverted trough or tropical wave does have a convergent flow at the surface. And so air flowing through this thing is going to be forced to rise. And if other factors are still there, then that persists with time, then the pressure will lower more with time. So these are isobars here. This is another diagram looking at the convergence associated with the tropical wave. These are streamlines here, as opposed to isobars. Streamlines are indicating the wind flow direction. They're a little different than isobars, but sometimes they're used in tropical latitudes because often the pressure gradients in tropical latitudes are not as strong as they are in higher latitudes. But in any event, you can see the distortion in the flow here um, and the convergence leading to upward motion. Okay. Distorts the wind flow, convergence. It's going to lower the pressure even more. If the conditions are right, then the process will continue. And after a while, maybe you get a closed low center developing in this area with more precipitation persisting for longer periods of time. Okay. If this can be sustained, pressures may lower enough. So what are the conditions to sustain these features? There they are. Got to have warm sea surface temperatures. That indicates an abundant supply of warm, moist air available for that latent heat transformation, or as Frank called it, the latent caloric. Have to have surface convergence present. Sometimes that comes from a pre-existing disturbance moving off, in the case of the Atlantic, moving off Africa. Have to have upper level outflow or divergence present. Surface convergence, upper level divergence, allowing for the persistence of the upward motion. Winds have to be uniform and light through the entire depth of the atmosphere because as this vertical motion is first established, this vertical structure, it's rather fragile. And if you get a 30, 35 knot wind punching through the middle of it, it's going to disrupt it and the system will not survive. And you've got to be at least five degrees north or south of the equator. Why? Coriolis, right? The equator, no Coriolis, can't have rotary motion. Tropical cyclones will never cross the equator. As I say, always and never are words we don't talk about much, but that's one situation where it works. <laughs> a graphic look at the uh, dimension, and I like to talk about this a little bit in terms of an atmospheric chimney. Okay? If you have a fire in your cabin in the woods, you build a fire in the fireplace, but you don't open the damper, what happens? Well, the place fills up with smoke, first of all, but secondly, the fire doesn't go because you're not drawing the air through. Okay? Same thing here. If we don't have this upper level divergence aloft, then this vertical structure is not going to happen and you're not going to see the system develop. So if all this happens, and after a while, now you've got a lot of isobars and a lot of wind and a well-established tropical cyclone with dramatic drops in pressure. Vertical look, a uh, well-developed hurricane typically has an upper level high located above it. And often, if the uh, 
the satellite photographs or the satellite movies that you see the television news people presenting, uh, you'll look at that and you'll see this thing spinning and you look at it and say, geez, it's spinning clockwise. I say, wait a minute. I went to the CCA seminar at my tags and I know that tropical cyclones ro rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. What's going on? Well, you're seeing the upper level outflow that this high will produce in many cases. Okay. <clears throat> Differences between tropical cyclones and extratropical cyclones with the mid-latitude lows that we just talked about. These uh, develop in a homogeneous air mass, no fronts in a tropical cyclone, just one air mass as opposed to two air masses. They're generally not as big, space uh, size-wise, horizontal dimensions. Pressure gradient is typically much steeper. That gives rise to the wind now. You'll be able to find a situation where I say, well, I saw a hurricane so-and-so back in this year, and then I looked at this, this wintertime low, and the winds in that wintertime low were stronger than the, yes, that's true. But on average, you're going to see stronger winds with well-developed tropical cyclones. <clears throat> Warm core systems due to the tremendous latent heat release from the rising air and that tropical moisture releasing the heat as it rises, that leads to a warm core to the system. That's the fundamental structural difference between mid-latitude lows which have a cold core. That corresponds to the 500 millibar trough, which Lee will talk about shortly. Usually dependent uh, tropical cyclone of surface convergence being present, then of all the other conditions that we went through there, then, then the system is off to the races. For extratropical lows or mid-latitude lows, it's usually the upper level conditions that come first. So I like to say tropical cyclones develop from the bottom up, extratropical cyclones develop from the top down. Classifications, once you get a rotary circulation, it's a tropical depression. Wind speeds reach 34 knots, tropical storm. And when they get to 64 knots, it's a hurricane. Uh, call them typhoons in the Western Pacific. We further classify them by using the Saffir Simpson wind scale. And here's the, the quick and dirty and all this stuff. And many of you are familiar with these definitions. Uh, tropical depression, tropical storm, hurricane, and then the categories, one through five. Um, the ones in yellow are considered major hurricanes. I've had a few different comments about the Saffir Simpson scale over the years. Some people say it's the worst thing that ever came along because the public, it was never meant to be public actually when it was first developed. It was meant to be used by emergency managers for determining uh, evacuations along the shore. But uh, the public would, would say, well, they got a hurricane warning for your area. Yeah, but it's only category one and then they don't do anything. 64 to 82 knots sustained wind. That's a lot of wind. <laughs> that, can, that can wreck stuff and break stuff, so uh, it's important to pay attention to that. There are areas of low pressure, so the circulation counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, no front, so less distortion of the circulation. The isobars tend to be more circular around a tropical cyclone as compared with an extratropical low. Upward motion concentrated near the center of the tropical cyclones until they reach hurricane status, and then it's in the eye wall. Um, sometimes you have clear skies with compensating downward motion in the eye itself and very light winds right near the eye. Okay. Precipitation, as opposed to the mid-latitude low where the precipitation is concentrated along the fronts and in various different parts of the cyclone. In the case of a tropical cyclone, it's arranged typically in circular bands. Uh, within these bands, that's where your upward motion is going to be intense. Uh, you'll have strong thunderstorms, a lot of gusty winds, sometimes a tornado. And wind gusts, in general, can exceed the state of wind intensity of a hurricane by 40%. So that tells you if you've got a 100 knot hurricane coming along, think about gusts to 140. Hopefully you're not out there in that. Cutaway look at a tropical cyclone showing the circular bands. The eye wall in this case was this region right here where the intense upward motion is occurring, downward motion within the eye itself, and the rain bands. And notice counterclockwise circulation here in the lower levels, but in the upper levels, that clockwise circulation provided by the high over the center of the, of the system. Another look. Pressure trace dropping dramatically near the center, in, indicative of a lot of isobars being crossed and a steep pressure gradient. Wind speed topping up in the eye wall here, and then a little bit of a minimum in the eye, and then back up again on the other side. Okay. Hurricane Igor, 2010, or if you're a fan of young Frankenstein, Igor. 
The yellow dot right here, anybody know what that yellow dot is? It's a weather buoy. Now we meteorologists get really excited when a tropical storm runs over a weather buoy. <laughs> because it gives us a chance to see some interesting data. And so here's the trace of this particular buoy. This blue line right here is the time of that satellite photograph that I just showed you. And so the red lines here are the blue lines showing the sustained wind speed and the red line showing the wind gusts. And you can see, looking at the scale here, you get 65 knots sustained and gusts measured by the buoy of 85 knots. Now, when you get to instrumentation measuring these winds, there's some question as to whether the instrumentation can actually keep up with the actual wind, but the message is certainly there that the wind is very strong as the system approaches. Here's the pressure trace, this green here, and here's the scale over here in inches and in millibars, and you can see it went right off the bottom here, so it was below 941 millibars when it ran over that buoy. The buoy survived, which is nice because we got the data. Okay, but you can see what happens, and, and the time frame here, these are 12-hour increments. Wind direction as the thing approaches here, and this looks more dramatic than it really is because this is a, because there's a discontinuity here, but you're seeing east, northeast, a little bit more north, northeast, north, northeast, and then and this is north up here too, and then it backs around to the northwest as the system goes by, showing the rotary motion around the system. So, like I say, this looks really dramatic here, but it isn't really. It's, you, could, you could continue it down here like this if you wanted to and have a repeating thing on it, but you get the idea. Sea state, significant wave height. Frank's gonna talk about what significant wave height means this afternoon, but for now, here's your significant wave height in feet here, okay? Topping out at about 38, 39 feet, significant wave height, meaning that there are gonna be some bigger ones. But the interesting thing about this, especially when comparing with the other graph about the winds, is the waves start to come up more in advance of the system because the waves will outrun the system, okay? And so you're gonna be looking at waves building well in advance of a system like this coming along, okay? So where are these animals gonna develop? In the tropical oceans, the warm tropical oceans. Uh, and then typically move in this direction here. So here's your hurricane season. The hurricane season is gonna be in the late summer to early autumn because that's when the surface uh, heating has, has been realized the most, the ocean temperatures are the warmest. And here are the areas where we see them develop typically. Atlantic Ocean, Eastern Pacific, Central and Western Pacific, and in the Southern Hemisphere as well. No, nothing in the Southern Atlantic. Uh, when we were, went to school, we were told there are never any hurricanes in the South Atlantic. Well, there was one back in 2004, I believe it was. Um, and it became a Category 2 hurricane, struck the coast of Brazil and killed a couple of people. So we can't say that anymore, but they are very rare because of uh, wind patterns and, and temperature patterns here. Excuse me, Ken. Uh, that cyclone in Brazil, the actor routed Steve Fawcett around the positive side of it. <laughs> around the world yeah. Amazing. Early stages, tropical cyclones tend to be steered by lower level features in the atmosphere. Uh, these systems are developed in the trade winds belt, so typically they're gonna move east to west, okay? As they develop and extend higher in the atmosphere, they'll fall more under upper levels, uh, winds patterns. Uh, we call them steering currents, um, and their motion will be directed by these winds. And if the steering currents, as we call them, are fairly uniform, then the prediction of them isn't too bad, okay? Often there's an area where the subtropical ridge is a bit weaker, and on the western side of the ridge, that, that's where the tropical cyclone will tend to curve more toward higher latitudes, move poleward. If that subtropical ridge extends most of the way across the ocean, in the case of the Atlantic, that's gonna drive the systems across the Caribbean into the Gulf of Mexico, Central America, Texas. On the other hand, if there's a weakness in the ridge in the western Atlantic, that's when you're gonna get systems turning more northward and perhaps threatening the eastern US or Bermuda, okay? As they move more toward the poles, they're eventually gonna come out of the influence of the westerlies, and they will, as we say, recurve, meaning turn more to the north and eventually northeast. The westerlies are typically stronger, and so the forward speed of the systems will typically increase at that point. As I say, if the steering currents are well aligned between the upper levels and lower levels, the motion of the tropical cyclone is usually not terribly difficult to predict, with Frank's uh, caveat about probabilities and stochastic processes. But if the steering currents are weak or indeterminate, then that motion becomes much more difficult to predict, and that's when you get systems stalling, looping around themselves, or taking unexpected turns, that sort of thing. So again, back to this diagram. Typical tracks moving off in this direction, east to west, perhaps recurving, coming up like this. 
in the East and Pacific. These systems, by the way, form down in this area, become very intense very quickly, and then often move up in this area and die very quickly. And why is that? Cold water. You're, you're encountering cold water here. Okay. Western Pacific, you can see the seasons here, uh, typically late summer into early autumn. Never say never, never say always. Hurricane Lenny, the wrong way hurricane, uh, formed in the northwestern Gulf of Mexico and moved east. Struck the Virgin Islands as a category four hurricane coming from the west, very unusual. That was the time here in November where there were a lot of boats heading down that direction too, so there was, a, there was a, an issue with that one. When will hurricanes begin to weaken? Well, basically when we remove the conditions that are required for their formation. Sometimes the weakening can be rather dramatic, uh, but not instant in most cases. So when are they gonna weaken? They move over colder water like that Eastern Pacific scenario I just showed you if they make landfall, and why is that? Well, when they make landfall, two things happen. Number one, you, you remove the abundant supply of warm, moist air because you're not over warm ocean temperatures anymore. But secondly, the surface friction increases a little bit and will help to slow down the winds a bit. If the upper level outflow is disrupted or removed, that's that atmospheric chimney effect. If we lose that, then this, the vertical structure is disrupted and they're not gonna go. And this is what you'll often hear television meteorologists talking about is wind shear, upper level wind shear. If dry air is entrained into the system, you'll often see that late in the season. If you get a cooler, drier air mass coming down to the north of the system in the northern hemisphere, that dry air is drawn in and all of a sudden you've lost that latent heat contribution to the energy of the system. These systems though can still produce a lot of rain, flooding, moving to higher latitudes, occasionally transition to extratropical oceanic lows when they encounter with another air mass. And then if the fundamentals are there for that system to strengthen, you could get a very strong system. And those are some of the strongest storms that hit the British Isles or, or old hurricanes that become extratropical. They develop fronts and they become very damage uh, creating systems for parts of Western Europe, particularly the British Isles. So how do you avoid these things or where do you want to avoid? What we suggest is that you focus not on the central pressure, not on the track of the center, not on the category, not on the wind strength, but on the area where 34 knot winds will be exceeded. 34 knot wind radius is given in all the tropical cyclone messages that you see. You want to avoid this region because typically once you're inside that 34 knot wind radius, now your navigation options become more limited. In other words, you want to get away from the system, but if you're in a situation where because of sea state or winds, you can't push your vessel in that direction, then you may end up getting pushed in a direction you don't want to get pushed in and see even more difficult conditions. To help determine that region, we've developed, uh, meteorologists over the years have developed a, a procedure called the one, two, three rule for mariners. It takes into account two factors, a 34 knot wind radius, which information you have on every tropical cyclone message that you receive, and the average forecast error of the position of hurricanes over the years. And here's graphically what it looks like. And in the graphic, it looks a lot neater than it does when you actually plot it on a chart because typically these circles will overlap. But in general, you're looking at a, a your tropical cyclone message will give you an initial position, a 24-hour forecast, a 48, and a 72-hour forecast. From that, you can derive the 34-knot wind radius, and then you're going to add an error factor to each circle. Now, in this original look at the 1, 2, 3 rule, that error factor was considered to be 100 nautical miles, 200 nautical miles, 300 nautical miles at 24, 48, 72 hours, respectively. Because when the rule was devised, that worked pretty well. But if we look at the average track errors over the decades, you see a dramatic improvement here. In the 1970s, the average forecast error of a 72-hour forecast was almost 400 nautical miles. Now it's down to 100 nautical miles or less. So we've seen a fairly significant improvement in the track forecast, which sort of begs the, uh, the change of the 1-2-3 rule to look at something that looks a little bit more uh, relevant for today's numbers. And here it is, instead of using 100, 200, 300, we use one degree, two degrees, three degrees of latitude, 60, 120, 180 nautical miles added to the one, two, three rule. Um, and we've been teaching this in the professional maritime schools for several years now. And, and I know Joe may talk about this this afternoon, but they're working on getting the Hurricane Center to adopt this as, as something uh, that's a little bit more relevant for today. 
I stole these slides from Joe. Thank you very much, Joe. These are the Hurricane Center's uh, danger graphic uh, presentations. And this dotted line here shows what's called the 5% uh, probability, 5% uh, chance of winds 34 knots or greater. So again, it's keyed on the 34 knot wind area, okay? And Joe did the, the work of superimposing what we call the new one, two, three rule onto this graphic, and guess what? It matches pretty well, okay? And he picked a few different storms to look at. These are storms from last year. That was Ophelia. This is uh, Maria, I believe, um, and, uh, and Jose. And you can see in each case, the one, two, three rule works, works pretty well. So you have this graphic available online, so why would you want to learn the one, two, three rule? Well, a couple of reasons. <clears throat> First of all, you may not be able to get the graphic when you're at sea, depending on what your connectivity is, okay? Secondly, if you look at the graphic and you can see, well, that's, that's 10 degrees of latitude right there. It's perhaps not the detail that you might like. You might want to plot it on a chart that has a little bit more of a, a scale appropriate to what your particular vessel is. And thirdly, and most important actually, is looking at the tropical cyclone message and actually taking what I think is one of your most powerful navigation tools on board. Ralph can talk about this this afternoon, and that's your pencil. And the five to 10 minutes it takes to actually plot that will embed the nature of that system in your mind a lot better than just taking a really quick look at a graphic like that. Now, it's nice that the graphic is there and you have it available for you, and it's a, a sort of belt and suspenders approach. You can take a look at the graphic and plot it yourself. But if you don't have the graphic, you'll have the text message and you can put this uh, information together. And basically, what you want to do is, is avoid this area. Stay out of that area. There's what the tropical cyclone message looks like. There's your 34 knot wind radius right there. It's given in quadrants in nautical miles. So you have that information at hand with every advisory that you're going to see. Okay. I'm doing good time-wise. So I got time to show some of my picture gallery here. There's Hurricane Aaron, 2001. Note the circular nature of the system. Okay, there's the eye, and you can see the circular bands here. Isabel, 2003. It's a little bit bigger. This is, this is a fairly sizable hurricane, actually. And here's the eye right here. You can see it just south of Hatteras. And the concern with Isabel at the time was its track, because it was headed generally north. And there was a concern that the center of the system was going to go right up through the Chesapeake Bay um, in September. And the Chesapeake Bay in September is pretty warm, which meant that the core of it could potentially stay over warm water all the way up into the Chesapeake Bay. And what do we got at the upper part of the Chesapeake Bay? This place, for one. But big metropolitan areas would have impacted a lot of people. Um, and so that was a big concern. As it turned out, it actually tracked just a little bit west of the Chesapeake Bay uh, and did weaken a bit. Still was a concern for these areas, but not as much as it would be uh, had the core remained right over the Chesapeake Bay. And this next slide I'm going to show you is, is one that I showed you earlier, actually. And this is just to compare sizes. Keep in mind that this is a fairly good-sized hurricane. Particularly, if we go back and look at Aaron there, Isabel is bigger than Aaron. But look at the mid-latitude low and how big the mid-latitude low is, extending all the way from eastern Canada all the way down to the Bahamas. So there's your size comparison right there to show you how much larger these mid-latitude lows are than tropical cyclones. Tropical Storm Franklin, 2005. Remember that one? Probably not. Because the top, this is what upper-level shear will do. The top was blown right off it. You can see this, the low-level circulation here, and all the upper-level stuff has been blown off to the top of it. The vertical structure no longer well aligned. This system dissipated within a very short period of time. Katrina in the Gulf of Mexico. A storm that uh, sort of surpassed Camille, I guess, as the quintessential Gulf hurricane. Um, and there's a close up of Katrina. And you can see the three-dimensionality of it, and how, how deep that eye is in there. And you can also see the low-level uh, bands through here. And you can see the, the high, thin cirrus. That's the upper-level outflow coming out of the top of the thing. Okay? And you can see that circulating all around there. Radar signature showing the circular bands of precipitation. This is Hurricane Charlie in 2004. In 2004, there were four landfalling hurricanes in the United States. Every one of them hit Florida. 
Uh, and this is uh, the Florida Keys here, Key Largo, and Key West is out here. This is the radar from Key West. But you can see the circular nature of the precipitation where the reds and the yellows are the heavier precipitation, the blues are the somewhat lighter precipitation, and you can see the bandedness of it here around the center of it. Typically, we don't get very many radar, good radar pictures of hurricanes because when they're well-established like this, they're usually far offshore out of the range of radars, but this one happened to be a good one, so I, I grabbed it. Wilma, 2005, still stands as the record for surface pressure in the Western Hemisphere, 882 millibars surface pressure in the center of this thing. And this is what we call a pinhole eye here, uh, when the thing was most intense, very, very small diameter eye. Think in terms of Winter Olympics time, so think in terms of the figure skater. When the figure skater is going out doing her spins and she draws in her arms, what happens? She goes faster and faster and faster. Same thing, with the same idea at play here. Hurricane Wilma sitting off Cozumel here as a uh, Category 5 hurricane. Stalled there for a little while and, and really didn't, didn't do Cozumel any good, that's for sure. So. Uh, it was a Category 5 storm, so it had to be, you know, 136 knots or more. I don't, in particular, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't remember, but strong. I know that at the time I was actually working on a contract with my tags here doing uh, uh, some instruction on Carnival Cruise Line's ships, and this was uh, shortly after this hurricane had come through that we were on a cruise ship going down there. Uh, and Cozumel, the economy of Cozumel dictated mostly by uh, people from cruise ships who come in there and spend a lot of money on worthless trinkets. Um, and, uh, and so the cruise ships tried to get back there as soon as possible after the hurricane. Well, the, the, uh, the pier was gone. The cruise ship pier was, was not there anymore. So they had to tender people in in boats, and I, I, was, I didn't go in because I was working on the ship at the time, but I looked into binoculars and you could see large buildings where there was just a shell of the building left, you know, a, a concrete or masonry building, and you could look right through it. There was nothing of the interior left at all. So. And there we are. Um, I don't know, Frank, do you want to do questions and answers now? Hold them for the round table this afternoon, or what would you like to do? We can take a couple of questions. We can uh, okay. also take a little bit of a break. You're the boss. <laughs> How about that? Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll take, a, take a few questions and uh, maybe take a five minute break for. A stand up. Yep, and back. 500 millibars, is that chosen to reduce the surface effects or why is it chosen at 500? I'm going to defer that question to Lee, who is coming up next with 45 minutes on that very topic. Okay. And yep. Uh, the plan right repeat now the is not to do that. Um, but I don't know what's afraid. Repeat the question. Well, he wants to know whether the slides are going to be available. No. We're going to be making a video. The video is made, so you'll it's be able to be coming along. The, the slides are not available. 